If you ask people about New York, they always tell you about the Empire State Building. And if you ask them about Rio, they talk about the statue of uh, Christ on top of the... Uh, uh, London, Big Ben, and uh, St Paul's Cathedral, and so on and so forth. Sydney. Sydney is the bridge, the Opera House, and the harbour. So people around the world know uh, that our harbour exists, and many of them would would uh, would love to see it. But they all have we all have a connection in some way. Mine started a long time ago. I was born in London in 1936. Uh, the war came along. I lived in central London. Uh, Dad went away, we didn't see him, we saw him about once a year for the next five years, but he did come home, thank goodness. And I remember lots of things about the war, but the thing that really sticks in my mind is a couple of times a year a truck came down the road and unloaded at our house a big cardboard box. And on top of the cardboard box was a map of Australia. And inside that box were wonders to behold. Tins of golden circle pineapple. <laughs> Granny Smith apples wrapped up in tissue paper and all lots of lovely things. And the ladies in Sydney who packed these boxes were not supposed to put anything else in the boxes at all, only what was in front of them. But they did. They wrote little notes saying, we're thinking of you and, you know, keep your chin up and things like that. And they knitted things for babies and stuck them in underneath. My mum used to put all these things away in the bottom drawer of the wardrobe. I can still see the old, her old wardrobe. Uh, all wrapped up in blankets, and they were brought out at Christmas time. And so at Christmas time, we had all these wonderful things, and I grew up thinking Australia was this sort of nirvana out there that had all these wonderful things. And one year in the box was a book of photographs of Sydney Harbour, uh, the sailing boats, the ferries, the bridge, and everything else. And my mum said, you've always wanted to sail, so you better have this. It became my most cherished possession. It still is. If you come to my house and go into my library, the first thing you see is up on a little stand, all by its side. So I grew up thinking that Sydney Harbour was this magical place out there that produced Golden Circle Pineapple and, <laughs> and Gaddish and Apple, all these other lovely things. When I came here, I did, admit, I did manage to track down two of those ladies who had uh, written to us to thank them uh, personally. But I can assure you that, um, you know, as a young boy growing up in, in London and uh, having bombs dropped on us and everything, those parcels from Australia, well, wonderful. So that's where my, into, my, my thoughts about Sydney Harbour uh, came from. And when I came here as a 10 pound bomb in 1956, and I was on Z deck on the Orontes, we were about 100 <laughs> feet underwater. When we left the cabin in the morning, we used to take everything for the day because it was just too much to go try and go down again. And um, we came in and we turned left, and my book came alive, uh, and there it was in front of me, and I said, Wow, will you look at that? Isn't that absolutely fantastic? I have spent half of my working life in the bush, uh, but I uh, know Sydney Harbour intimately. I have sailed, motorboated, water skied, uh, swam. I've visited all the beaches, uh, and it's gone full circle now. And I'm teaching my grandchildren to sail on the harbour. So it's been a very, very big uh, part of my uh, of my life. However. My first forays onto the harbour in the 50s and early 60s, there were a lot of places in the harbour you could not go. Most of North Head was out of bounds, Middle Head was out of bounds, you couldn't go to Woods Dock, you couldn't go on Cockatoo Island, and so on and so forth, because they were all military establishments. Army, not Navy. And uh, so they were forbidden territory. And I always used to think, if only I could get up there, it would be a wonderful view. Well, I, I bring you great news, because all those places that we were forbidden to go, we can now go, and you and I own them. The trust is only looking after them on yours and my behalf. And they're accessible 365 days a year, totally free of charge, there's no cost, and when you come, we'll give you all the maps and all the help, and you can come as an individual, and we'll give you the maps, you can wander around, you can come on a guided tour at regular times, or you could come as a group, such as yourselves, and book a tour, and we will take you around. If you like, I think I'd like to really call my talk today Your Sydney Harbour Real Estate Portfolio. <laughs> because I'm going to take you through the eight lovely harbour sites which you and I own and are definitely in law and perpetuity going to be there for people to enjoy for a long time to come. The one that you're looking at, of course, is, is uh, North uh, Head. Uh, you can see uh, Fairy Manly uh, Beach is just starting down on the right hand, uh, right hand end there. There's the start of Manly Beach, Fairy Bower in here. 
you've got the Cardinal's Palace, Manly Hospital, and when you take your overseas visitors out to the North Head Lookout, you go out there. Um, this is the uh, Sydney Water uh, Sewerage Works. Uh, parts of this around are Sydney Harbour National Park, but this great big chunk in the middle, which is the old school of artillery, belongs to you and me. And I'll tell you more about that uh, later on. But it is a lovely place uh, to visit. So let's go on a little journey uh, around the uh, hub. Now, the Trust is a federal government uh, agency that came into being in 1990. Do you remember Kelly's Bush at Hunters Hill? The first big uh, battle, conservation battle. Kelly's Bush, a lovely piece of ground that uh, the developers suddenly thought they could get hold of um, and build lots of flats and things like that. And people were outraged about this. And so there were local committees and all sorts of people. There was even a Kelly's Bush committee in Hong Kong. People, Australians living up there who just didn't want to see this built on. It looked as if the build battle was lost until uh, Jack Mundy got involved. Do you remember? It's the first green ban of the Builders Labourers Federation. I'm always interested in how culture changes because some people at that time thought that Jack Monday was the devil incarnate. What a terrible man. Now, he's a saint. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's absolutely wonderful the thing that he uh, started. So, a bit like my work at the, at the library. When I came here in 1956, I couldn't find anybody who had a convict ancestor. <laughs> Everybody's ancestors were free settlers. There weren't any convicts anywhere. Now, at the State Library, our biggest growing section is family history, and people are coming in on a daily basis desperate to find a convict ancestor, <laughs> because it's now a badge of honour to have a convict. So culture does uh, change in our, in our lifetimes. After Kelly's Bush, we come into the 90s, and the government in Canberra decided that all these places around the harbour, which were federal government territory, uh, the military could probably be in better places. And so they were going to withdraw them and, of course, the developers immediately started to rub their hands all over again. But because Kelly's Bush had been won, uh, people got rose up all over the place and said, you're not going to get your hands on these. But again, a little bit iffy as we went through, uh, but then the centenary of Federation was coming and somebody, I know not who, um, in Canberra had the bright idea that as a great gesture for Federation, these lands should be given back to the people, to you and I which is a wonderful concept, because we own them in the first place. So they're only giving us back something that we already owned. But nevertheless, that is why it's called the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, because it was that happy accident in history that caused the trust to be uh, formed. You've already read all that uh, behind me. You can see we come under the department of... The department seems to get a longer name every week, and I'm not sure who our minister is this week. Um, um, so I don't even try to think about it, but we do have, do have a, a, a minister. And as you see, uh, it manages, on yours and my behalf, uh, 137 hectares and 408 historic buildings. An enormous uh, responsibility uh, to, uh, to undertake. So in 2001, the Act was proclaimed, uh, and since then, comprehensive site plans and so on and so forth. The life of the Trust was extended because it was doing such a particularly good job. You can see how the management goes there. We even have volunteer representatives um, on the board. It's very, a very democratic uh, organisation, even though we come under the uh, federal government. And uh, our director, Jeff Bailey, um, is a wonderful man who believes that there should be input from the owners, which is you and I all the time, and so that when you come to the sites, if you've got any ideas or criticisms or anything, the Trust welcomes those all the time as an ongoing part of the growth. Can I just ask a question yeah. on that chart. It yeah. says it finishes in 2033. That's right. What happens then? Don't know. Oh, mm. Don't you know. I'm hoping, of course, that the Trust is going to do such a good job uh, that it will be extended um, again. Mm -hmm. I think the idea, actually, uh, was to hand it probably back to state authorities and, and offload it off the federal books. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, that's what's happened uh, so far. <laughs> yes, that, uh, Incidentally, if you have any, any questions, do, do um, bring them out as we go. When I go to talk to, uh, uh, listen to other speakers these days, I often think, oh, I must ask that question. But because of the age I am, when we get to the end, I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> so do please ask. I'm so glad. It's, it's kind of a comment. That often people say, oh, you know, the Australian Aboriginal 
developing and getting more and more uh, people over 100, so we might well be able to be there in, in, in 2032. I'll be there if you go. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Now here is your real estate portfolio. Starting in the right hand end, that's North Head, and that green part is a great big chunk of the old school of artillery. Coming over to the middle, the middle head at Mossman, in two parts, the upper part on Middle Head, and then down at the bottom from George's Heights, Chowder Bay, uh, down uh, there. And I'll show you nice pictures of all these shortly. Coming across to Vaucluse, you can see the Marine Biological Research Station is at Watson's Bay, and then up next to the gap, the Macquarie Light Station. It's called a light station because that's the light itself and the, co and the keeper's cottages. The whole thing is called a light station. See, when you woke up this morning, you didn't know you owned a lighthouse, did you? You own a lighthouse, and you must come and visit it sometimes. Coming up the harbour, you can see the former HMS Platypus. Uh, that's the old submarine base at Neutral Bay. And then coming under the bridge and up the harbour, we have the Woolwich Dock and Parklands. They're on the end of the Hunters Hill Peninsula. And then the largest island in the harbour, Cockatoo, and the smallest island, which is Snapper. So the eight sites are going right from one end of the harbour to the other. So there's the vision, and while you read the vision, I'll just concentrate on the photographs. Top left is one of my fellow volunteers uh, taking uh, a tour at Middlehead. Bottom left, another group of volunteers who are restoring machinery on, uh, on Cockatoo Island. There's about 50 people on the staff of the Trust and of just on 200 volunteers who do all sorts of different things. The bottom right, uh, you can see more of my fellow volunteers uh, taking tours um, at Middle Head around the old gun emplacements. And uh, now and again at Heritage Week and things like that, they allow us to dress up. Boys never grow up, really, and uh, love dressing up. And we're trying to get them to let us fire the cannons, uh, but we haven't succeeded yet. <laughs> uh, but we live in hopes. We do live in hopes that one day we'll get to fire uh, a cannon. So the location facilities is I reflect uh, the central part played by the harbour in our history. Uh, and the difficulty with working on the sites is the multiple layers of history. Because at all sites, we've got indigenous, colonial, convict, military and maritime. And we've got to be very careful when working on one that we don't impinge uh, and do nasty things to the other. This is a before and after picture. Um, at uh, Middlehead at Headland Park. Uh, that's the old game placements from the uh, late 19th century, uh, which are all still there. Uh, there's a beautiful lookout now. Those game placements are just over the top there. You can stand and look at them. So if you haven't got time to take your overseas visitors out to North Head, just go to Mossman because this lookout is absolutely superb. You can look down into Rose Bay, right down to the Manly Ferry Wharf, and back to the city. It's a really, really beautiful beautiful place. Right, here we go. Eight sites. Number one on the list is Woolwich Dock and Parklands and Kelly's Bush, which started it all, is there. That's Kelly's Bush, which is still there and still beautiful, thanks to the actions of a lot of people. You can see the dock is carved straight into the solid Sydney sandstone. Better picture of it there, you can see. And you can see the old uh, buildings on the left of the dock. This is where the army uh, had their maritime section uh, where they had their ducks, um, you know, that run ashore and the front drops down and people uh, disembark. So most of this, as you can see, uh, the horse and goat paddock, all, everything's been done here now. The gardens are beautiful. If you're not interested in the maritime history, perhaps you're interested in old colonial gardens. And a lot of our volunteers uh, are restoring colonial gardens on some of the sites, particularly uh, Cockatoo. As on all the sites, there are places that not many people go. When I go here with my grandchildren, we normally come right out here. Not many people come out here. They tend to stick around over there. And from here, if you sit on this corner, you're looking straight up the harbour under the harbour bridge. It's absolutely the most glorious place. At all the sites, you can get a cup of coffee or something to eat. But I always take my thermos and a sandwich because we can go to all these little secret places uh, on them and have a really, uh, really enjoyable time. And so there's the history. As always around the harbour there was Aboriginal habitation. Uh, the Clark family uh, farmed there, Atlas Engineering, that building's still there. And then dear old Thomas uh, Mort, of course, the first person to set frozen 
uh, meet to England. He had his dock already close to the city, but he constructed this one in 1901. And at that time, it was the largest dock um, in the Southern Hemisphere. Then the army came along, used it as their maritime headquarters, and it was closed just at that time the trust uh, came along. You might be interested to know that um, the first train on Garden Island was manufactured by Atlas Engineering at that site where more stock is. Well, there we are. Just learn something. You learn something Island. every day. Every day. Atlas Engineering manufactured the first crane for Garden Island. These are views around. You can walk all around the site. And although the buildings are let to Noakes Brothers, um, you can go right up and look in their workshop. And there's always beautiful Sydney Hobart races and beautiful yachts there um, to, uh, to look at. It's quite incredible. And like all of them, sunrise to sunset, uh, free access, uh, and plenty of maps and things available. Now we've shot right up the other end of the harbour to uh, Snapper Island. You're sitting in Birkenhead Point Shopping Centre and you're looking out into the harbour and what most people see is the big water tower on the top of Cockatoo. But if you drop your eyes, you'll see this little tiny island um, in front of you next time you go. You can see it's a conglomeration of old corrugated iron buildings and, and sorts of things. At the moment we don't take people there because we're only starting work on these buildings in the near future because the access will have to be by water and we'll need to do a lot of organisation. So this has been low on the, uh, on the priorities um, up till now, but work will start uh, soon. Uh, so there's the history, Public Recreation Reserve originally, and uh, during World War I, additional stories for Cockatoo. Remember, during both wars, some 4,000 people a day went to work on Cockatoo Island, 24-hour uh, shifts. You can imagine the comings and goings um, that there were. We'll see more about that later when we have a look at it. And then, of course, it was levelled and the cadet training depot. A couple of years ago, when I was um, doing this talk, at this point, a gentleman jumped up at the back and he came running up to the front. I thought, oh, what, what, you know, what, what, what have I And he raced up and he said, that's me! <laughs> that's me! Which I thought was fantastic. Which, uh, which brings me to the ability to say to you, if you know anybody, family, friends or anybody, that has had anything to do with any of the harbour sites that the Trust looks after, do please let us know. Um, you can come over to Mossman, the head office, or we'll come and visit you, because we'd love to get down as much social history um, as we can. And if you come over to Mossman, we'll give you a good lunch and look after you and just get you to talk about of what it is. So if, you do, if anybody says, oh, I had an uncle there or so-and-so, you never know. We're collecting history um, all, the, all the time. Excuse we, me, I, I ask, why did you mention Spectacle Island? Because it's not ours. It's, it's still, still under the Navy. Yeah, yeah. They used to store torpedoes. Yeah. Yeah. They used to store torpedoes and other munitions. Yeah, they, yeah they, had, they had a lot of their historical stuff. That's, that's the main receptacle for the Royal Australian Navy Heritage Collection. Yeah. Right. That is where it is all And they transferred some of that to the some Museum of Garden Island. Island, Island but made. the bulk yeah. of it is out of Spectacle Island. Yeah, okay. When you were talking about Snapper Island, um, you said renovation, will that have asbestos in it? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yep. Probably. Any idea when that will be open? For us to have a no. I, I believe that during the next 12 months we will probably have a couple of open days uh, for people to go and look and collect ideas about what is going to, what is going to happen. Yeah, but it'll be a, it'll, it'll be a while. Is there any sort of security on uh, Snapper Island? Because uh, a lot of the period when I was uh, not occupied, you know, a lot of stuff went missing because they had all the Clarks for every um, Royal Australian naval vessel, quite a number of them have disappeared. Yeah. The ships, wheels, and goodness knows what else, bells, etc. Yeah. We've got resident, resident caretakers now on Copper 2 on that side, and I believe they do make regular you know, follows yeah. over there. Just one question um, Shark and Snapper Island, not just Snapper, Shark and Clark Islands, do they come under the national parks? National parks, yeah. Here's Birkin Headpoint Shopping Centre. You know, they put that roof over the, over the top now. Remember, that's the old Dunlop, the old Dunlop factory is now the Birkin Headpoint Shopping Centre. Uh, and here's a little snapper, and you're on Cockatoo Island uh, now, just to give it to, 
Yeah. So stand by for open days, and when there's an open day, come along and let us know what you think. When you take people out to North Head to show them that wonderful uh, view, you drive up from Manly, you pass the hospital, the old Cardinal's Palace, which is now the International Hotel School, um, and then you used to come to a driveway on your left, uh, which had a nice tree line, and it had nice flowers and flower beds, uh, and you thought, wasn't well, that nice? I'll go up there. But the sign said, you will be shot if you come in here, go away. Trespassers will be prosecuted because this was the, art, uh, the artillery school. Now, if you drive up, it still looks beautiful, and the sign says, Welcome, come in. And in you go. And this is the uh, site that we look This is the entrance building. You drive through here and uh, you find the car park. Here's a bigger one of it. You can see it's a huge site. There's the road going out to um, the lookout. Here's North Fort. And all this area in here belongs to So you can see there's a huge range of buildings and a very large area of untouched bushland. One of the last pieces of really untouched bushland uh, in Sydney. And the birds um, and small mammals in there are really wonderful. It's dominated by this H-shaped building on your left. These were built in the late 30s as part of the forward defence of Sydney. The defence of Sydney was moving out uh, from Middle Head out to uh, North Head, and they must have had an awful lot of money um, at the time, because instead of shoving up uh, some barracks, they built these beautiful Art Deco uh, buildings. And when you go inside, they've got curved corners and beautiful plaster work. They're absolutely superb, so whoever uh, had it had a good budget at the time. Uh, the H-shaped building is where 200 young artillerymen uh, were uh, trained, and of course there are gun emplacements and tunnels honeycombing uh, North Head all over the place uh, for their training. The little short bar of the H, the two-storey part there, the lower part was the mess where they ate and socialised. And the top uh, one is the ballroom uh, which has a sprung a floor, all beautifully art a deco. Amazing. You may have seen this building and the parade ground in front of it because uh, they have filmed The Biggest Loser um, and uh, all sorts of other programs uh, here. That's a part of the income. Now our income from the government is coming to an end and we're going to have to be a self-sourcing pudding. The buildings, as they are renovated, are rented out or hired and it is that income that is going to keep everything uh, maintained, the gardens, the roads, the buildings and so on. Is there accommodation there for the public to go for the weekend? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. At some of the sites, um, at uh, North Head and on Cockatoo Island and shortly here, uh, some of the old officers' court houses and things like that have been renovated. Um, and if you look on the website, it will tell you all about them and show you photos and so on. Some of the houses that occupy uh, can take eight people, ten people, or twelve people. I've been out there recently, and it looked like the houses were empty. I think some of them are in a, in a, in a process of being refurbished at the moment. Yeah, there's always an ongoing pro program that's being uh, done. So the Art and Museum, that rents space from you. Yes, North Ward. It, it's 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 now part. The the army decided a couple of years ago that they were going to uh, move it to Puckapunyal um, in Victoria, uh, which of course is a wonderful place to run a museum. You know, right out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Uh, but the the area always came under the auspices of the trust, and the trust has now taken that over. And some of the old volunteers are now have come over. Um, to the trust. Uh, recently, for example, I went out um, on an evening thing out there where they got the old searchlights fired up. Um, and that, to me, was a bit, uh, a bit chilling, having been in London right through the war and been surrounded by uh, searchlights. To see these up again was quite a... I was waiting for the all clear all the time, <laughs> all the time uh, but it didn't, uh, it didn't come. Uh, yes, the, the ballroom with the sprung floor, I was uh, showing people through on a tour uh, uh, some time ago and... Um, a young lady in the group said, what's, what's, a, what's a sprung floor? And I said, well, come out here and I'll show you. And she came out and I went like this and she just stood and looked at me. And, she didn't, and I suddenly realised they don't do that anymore. They just stand there and go like that. And I managed to persuade her and she said, oh, isn't that nice? I said, that's how we, 
got our dips and our chassis and our sways without damaging our, our knees. But it's all still there and all been beautifully um, refurbished and I do hope you'll come and see. Across the parade ground on the other side to the right is the officers' quarters which are also beautifully Art Deco and a beautiful, uh, lovely uh, carved bar of Tasmanian blackwood and things like that. Really beautiful. The budget must have been incredible uh, at the time. I had a tour and we went down to walk across from left to right to go and uh, a gentleman on the tour said to me, you can't walk across the parade ground. I said, why not? He said, you can't walk across the parade ground unless you're on parade. And I said, well, it's not an army base anymore. So we, we can uh, cross. I said, I'll tell you what, get in twos, <laughs> and I'll say, on your word, and, and we walked across. And it's red gravel, so it goes, shh, shh, shh. There we were, left, right, left, right, right across. And he walked around the outside. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, wow, how training, how training can get inside your uh, head. Absolutely. Uh, wonderful. You try walking around Garden Island with a band's playing and not getting a step. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's right. Good. You march. Uh, soldiers training, top left. Military band on the right, they've just let off a couple of cannons there. And at the bottom, part of the beautiful uh, bushland, the Trust has put um, beautiful tracks uh, through this. You can walk through this absolutely pristine bushland and there are hanging swamps in there which brings in lots and lots of bird life. And in fact, North Head itself has a huge reservoir of fresh water underneath it. Um, and uh, when you go through the tunnels on, uh, on the tours, when we take you through, there's a gutter on one side and there's this bubbling stream of beautiful fresh water going alongside you all the time. Coca-Cola were very interested in taking it uh, for the fact there wasn't enough of it, thank goodness, for them. Otherwise it would be all, uh, it would be all gone uh, by now. Again, Aboriginal people, they didn't live there. They went there for ceremonies uh, because they were down by the water in Manly and then the fortifications. Bottom left, there's a young lady lying on a plotting table. There, there are underground rooms. This was an underground plotting table where they plotted the trajectory for the uh, guns, uh, gun practice. Top. And then, of course, a young lady using the sprung floor in the, in the ballroom. North Fort, which is what we were talking about earlier, which was the uh, Naval Museum, uh, which was only incorporated when the army moved uh, out to the stuff to Pakapanyu, we moved in, and uh, you can see there some various uh, things there. But you can go through the tunnels and visit the gun emplacements. The guns on North Head were the same, the same as the, the biggest guns on Singapore. I believe so, yes. And across the block, they think it's the same. The same yes. All the old ammunition lifts and everything are still there, and you know, they lifted up the, uh, the ammunition from the magazines. Uh, when you come, as, as with all of the big sites, you'll find a visitor centre, and my fellow volunteers will give you all the maps and all the help to find your way around, or if you're on a book tour, uh, your guide will be waiting for you, or if you've come as a group, your guide will be waiting for you. At all the sites, we have um, things for children to do, so while you're walking around looking at the history, there are finding... Uh, you know, mystery things for them to find as they go around. And you might mention to your children or, or grandchildren that we run uh, curriculum-based educational programs at the sites run by specially trained teacher guides. Um, so it's another aspect of things that the Trust um, actually does. So it's now with Econ, instead of a school of artillery, it's now, we call it the sanctuary. It's a place of peace and quiet. Uh, of incredibly beautiful views of the harbour and the coast with lovely uh, uh, lookouts uh, and all sorts of uh, interesting things. Don't come for half an hour because you won't get out of the place under three or four hours. There's so much to see. Now we've crossed over to Middle Head where uh, the top part is called Headland Park and George's Heights and then there's a very short beautiful bushwalk down to the uh, harbour level and this down here is uh, Chowder Bay down here um, on the left. This bay here has got the cleanest water in, uh, in Sydney Harbour because of its geographical positioning. It's scoured by the tides uh, regularly and it's absolutely totally clear. If you go out on the edge of the jetty and look down, you'll think you're at the Barrier Reef because there are large families of seahorses that uh, live here. And I go here with my grandchildren and we snorkel out from the beach and we watch all these, uh, all these seahorses go.
Those two uh, tanks there, the green tanks, I remember quite well during the war, they put a false roof over the two tanks and they had a large side lion's tea rooms, as though the Japs could read English. <laughs> They are still, this is the only place in the harbour now, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the only place in the harbour now where uh, Royal Navy ships um, can fill up. And so they still do fill them up uh, from those, uh, from there. All these buildings have been totally restored. The university, combined universities, uh, Marine Research Association, uh, and you can do all sorts of interesting things down here, including that way you can, there are houses here. That'll show you how big the site is. The only part really that we're not concerned with on the right there is HMAS Penguin, which is next to Balmoral Beach. The Navy doesn't have any ships there anymore. It's their hospital. That's the Navy uh, hospital. Most of the work, when you look up where it says Headland Park and Harbour Trust Office and tunnels, that's all been uh, restored. And we're now working down here where it says Middlehead Asopa, the old school of Pacific administration uh, where they used to train teachers to go to the Pacific Islands and also train people who came here from the, uh, from the Pacific Islands. A lot of work uh, going on there at the moment. If you go there, you go through uh, the Mossman Shops. To the end of Mossman Shops, there's a roundabout and three roads. The right one goes into the suburb, the middle one goes to the zoo, and the left one goes to uh, Headland Park and George's, uh, George's Heights. And when you get there and park and you get out, you're surrounded by a lot of single-storey buildings which are all that remain of the old World War I hospital. By the end of 1915, something like 100,000 um, Australians who had been physically uh, wounded or mentally damaged were being returned to Australia and they built this hospital there um, to sort them out and triage them and work out where they were going to go. Most of those buildings are still there. Uh, and they have all been restored and uh, let out to numerous uh, people. We have lawyers and computer people, we have an artist's colony, uh, the old sergeant's mess from the 1880s is a kindergarten. Uh, so they're not uh, museums when you come to the sites. They're, they're, they're places where people are coming and going uh, and they've got a really good feel. One of the wards in one of the buildings, as you see, and we have partially set up one of the buildings um, as one of the wards, as it might have been uh, before. First aid up the top right. Bottom right is down at um, uh, Chowder Bay. And of course that hillside behind you there is now covered in houses worth hundreds of millions of dollars. This is the suburb of Clifton Gardens. But you'll see on the beach on the right the two big buildings are the picnic sheds and the hotel, both of which were there till the late 1920s. Uh, when both burned down, there's now just a beautiful park uh, and like all the harbour sites, you can catch public transport to them by ferry or bus. You can get a bus to Clifton Gardens or you can get a bus to George's Heights Headland Park. Those were the days when people, this was, this was quite remote in those days, and this is when, uh, when people generally travelled there by ferry. So the wharf was a very active place here, um, and there was a large uh, netted uh, swimming pool. Uh, Aboriginal uh, occupation, as always, and around the harbour. Uh, Bungaree's uh, Governor Macquarie, uh, Bungaree was his favourite Aborigine and he started a, uh, a little sort of vegetable garden for him up there and the area is, is, is still there. Uh, it was a miserable failure, um, really, I mean Lachlan Macquarie, who's a great favourite of mine, uh, really fell down on this one because I think it was a no-brainer why you would haul yourself up onto the Headland Park and try and water potatoes and turnips when you could sit by the harbour and have oysters and mussels and flathead um, is really, uh, really not a, not, a, not a go. However, uh, he, did, uh, he did try. You can see before and after the old hospital buildings on the left here as they were when the Trust took them over and now beautifully restored. Uh, there's beautiful gardens and all the paths are, are there. Top right is one of the buildings where the nurses are obviously having a party with some of the patients. And bottom right, one of the buildings is now the headquarters um, of the, uh, the Harbour Trust. So there's the current uh, uses. You can do so many things uh, there and you can catch a bus to the top or a bus to the bottom if you don't want to do the little uh, bushwalk uh, in, uh, in between. Excuse me, the nurse's picture, what, when was that taken? My great auntie was a nurse. The photo of the nurses you just had. Do you know when it was taken? 
Well, that must have, that must have been in the late, if like from say, 1916 to 1921. Yeah, she was in World War One as a nurse, my great auntie. Yeah, she might be in there. Because it, it closed at the end of 20, 1921, I think. So it was open for those for those years. Yeah. Uh, this the accommodation that I was that I was uh, mentioning. There are restaurants and cafes. Um, and displays, and at the bottom, that incredibly beautiful uh, beach at Clifton Gardens uh, with, uh, with the seahorse families down there. It doesn't mention so far on there the uh, fact that the end of the middle head was a golf club. Yes, indeed. Yes. Still partly there, too. Mm. Still partly there. The old golf club, the old golf clubhouse, um, is now a, a, an upmarket uh, cafe. Yeah, no, no, still, right. still go there. I mentioned already a SOPA, the Australian School of Pacific Administration. Those are the buildings that are just gradually being refurbished. You can see the, the quality in them uh, there. And most of the sites have a, a tennis court and barbecue facilities that you can use at, uh, at any time. It's just a matter of, of coming. Of, uh, I just want to know what that uh, Pacific Administration now is. When did the close out complete? Or just the, the buildings are now, I think, I think there's only two left to do now, I think. Do you, know, do you know where it's so where it was then? Where was it? Yeah, where, 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 where's it gone? Where's it gone? I don't think it exists anymore. Yeah. I don't think it exists anymore. No. I think that may have been probably as the Pacific Islands got to a certain level of government and uh, self-government, I think they maybe thought that it was probably a bit colonial of us to uh, you know, impose our conditions on them. So that may be. It was certainly extremely important. I almost went there not long after I came to Australia because they were screaming out for teachers in Papua New Guinea and they were running an intensive six month course uh, for teachers to go to Papua New Guinea and I almost, I almost, um, I almost did that. Uh, the middle picture on the right hand side is uh, one of my fellow volunteers coming out of one of the tunnels um, on Middle Head with a tour um, and a lookout. Uh, this is from a helicopter, of course. The gap is just off to your right-hand side, and you all know that uh, Governor Macquarie uh, built the original lighthouse in, um, in 1818, and this was the lighthouse that took over uh, later on um, in the 19th, uh, 19th century. The Trust opens the lighthouse uh, about four times a year uh, on a Sunday. It was two weeks ago we opened it. I, I'm always on duty at, at the lighthouse. And uh, so I did uh, quite a few trips to the top of the lighthouse um, on that uh, Sunday. I remember once one of our guys was sick and I did two lots on a Sunday and I got home and my wife said, did you have a good day? I said, fantastic, you know, I did ten trips to the top of the lighthouse. She said, you idiot. <laughs> I said, no, I'm fine, I'm absolutely fine. And the next morning I tried to get out of bed, my knees wouldn't work. So that's when you realise uh, how the years are how the years are uh, passed. Those buildings to the left of the lighthouse, yeah. are they relatively new? Because I was down there on the long weekend and I don't ever remember. I mean, I grew up around there, I don't ever remember seeing those buildings. Well, there's the old, remember the old lighthouse keeper's cottage? Yeah. They've always been there. But then that sort of row of funny white uh, terrace houses, yeah. yeah, they've been there since the 1970s, I think, 70s or 80s. Uh, Macquarie built the lighthouse, of, of course, with Francis Greenway as his, his architect. You all know that they had a, uh, a rather difficult relationship because they were both uh, very simple-minded people, but they did, between them, manage to leave us uh, a great legacy. And when uh, Macquarie was there and opened the lighthouse, I think he did a very classy thing because in front of the assembled throng, he opened the lighthouse, invited Greenway to step forward and gave him a full pardon. And I thought that was a pretty class thing, uh, pretty class thing to do. Much of Gates Greenway's uh, recommendation, of course, because um, of financial constraints at the time, it was built of inferior sandstone, and later on it started to disintegrate, so they put iron bands around it, like a corset, to keep it together. Uh, but eventually it just got too uh, shaky, and so in um, 1883, James Barnett, who designed so many buildings uh, that are around us, designed the new one. You can see they're almost, they're almost identical. And of course, Robert Watson, um, who lived down the bottom of the hill, who came out with the first fleet, uh, became the first lighthouse keeper, and uh, that's after whom Watson's Bay is named. So do come uh, to the lighthouse on that summit. We, we open it from 10 till 4, and we take um, groups of 
10 people to the top every, every 20 minutes. And the views from up there are to die for. Two weeks ago, when I took my first group to the top, and we walked out to walk around, and a lady said to me, do you ever see whales from up here? And I said, do you mean like that one? <laughs> and there they were, swimming north, going past us. Lots of, lots of them there. That, uh, the world, the world looks like a globe, doesn't it? It doesn't look flat when you're up there. The, yeah. world, the world looks like a globe, not flat. So it's still a working lighthouse, obviously, and uh, as you can see what's uh, happening. And like a lot of our sites, tell your children and grandchildren, we do children's birthday parties at a lot of the, a lot of the sites uh, with associated uh, you know, historical games and things like, uh, things like that. Now coming over to uh, Watson's Bay, where you've all been for fish and chips at uh, Doyle's, Watson's Bay is over the other side of this point, and this beach on the left is Camp Cove. Uh, and the house you can see the roof of is the former biological uh, station. Started by a very interesting man. He was an adventurer, a bit of a polymath, interested in all sorts of things. And when he came here, he discovered that nobody was studying the marine habitat of the harbour. And he persuaded the government, he must have been a good talker, persuaded the government to give him £300. And he raised some more money by donation. And he built his house. There it is there. And in the lower story, which is sort of half underground, he built a laboratory, which is still there. The benches and the glass cases and things are still, uh, are still there. And of course, Middlehead, which we've just been talking about, is over uh, there. Now, this is a, it's a very small house. It'd be quite difficult to open it to the public all the time. And so the Trust took a leaf out of Waverley Council's book. Uh, many of you would have been to Bronte House. Uh, you might remember that um, Leo Schofield did a deal with... Waverley Council, that he would totally restore the house and gardens in return for a peppercorn uh, rent for a number of That's what the Trust did with the biological station. They interviewed a large number of families who were very interested. Uh, a family was picked, and with their own money and under the uh, direction of our history and heritage people, uh, it's been totally restored. And uh, two or three times a year, it's open on a Sunday and they leave after breakfast uh, and we move in and you can come and look at the house and the garden and the laboratory uh, and talk about Nikolai and, and then uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon we uh, vacuum the floor and uh, put everything back like it was and then the family comes back uh, for dinner. It's a very good way of getting something looked after regularly when you know that you can't possibly economically keep it going all the time. What the trust, trust sites have done is it's opened up a lot more of the harbour side uh, walks. For example, you can go from the zoo round to Bradley's Head, you can go uh, round to Clifton Gardens, and then up round the back of HMO's Penguin, and onto the Spit Bridge, uh, and then all the way up to North Head. So there's a lot of the harbour now which is accessible, which was not accessible um, before. Uh, Camp Cove Beach, of course, was because uh, Arthur Phillip, when he uh, first came into the harbour, they'd been rowing all afternoon, uh, and I'm sure when Arthur Phillip came in in his uh, cutter um, and turned left, he said exactly what I did in 1956. Wow, look at that. But they were very tired, so they camped on this beach um, overnight, um, and he rowed up the harbour the next day, and the rest is history. But if you do this walk, the next little beach uh, is where all the very poor people in Sydney, go to swim because they can't afford swimming costumes. <laughs> so you have to be fairly careful as you walk across uh, across that beach. I'm going to flick through this because of the time. I'll just flick through this one fairly quickly. It's one of my favourite pictures of Sydney. You can see centre bottom the old uh, submarine base, and you can see there that it was first um, a gas works for many many years, which is why the site is so contaminated. Um, and then the Navy took it over for a period of time and you all remember the submarines being there. Now the bottom photo you can see buildings shrouded in plastic. <coughs> this is because we've finally got a grant from the government to decontaminate the site and take out all the asbestos and the assets and everything uh, that are there. It's quite a complicated process. And what the Trust has had to do is seal the buildings completely. And when you go in you have to wear a completely enclosed uh, suit uh, and they're taking all the old stuff away and they're mixing a lot of it with the cement and, and other stuff. The, um, the 
this. Uh, asbestos is it in ductwork or what, where is it? In ceilings, in ceilings and right. walls, yes, in sheeting, yeah. And some of that lagging, you know, around uh, around, around pipes, yeah. yeah. So that's what the buildings look like uh, today. And there will be open days uh, here later in the year uh, when that work is finished uh, and plans will be exhibited and the owners, in other words, you and I, uh, will be invited to open days uh, to come and see what it is. Now here's my last one. You can see Cockatoo is dominated by the two great docks here and here. This one built by convicts, this one not. These are convict buildings on the top, and you can see that the island has been chopped and material pushed out so that it's now about five times the size that it was originally. So it's got this huge flat area all the way around with a little hump left in the middle. So exactly the same as at, at Garden Island where they cut it and pushed it out. So the two great docks, convict built and not lovely old Art Deco buildings like the old uh, generator house here. These are shipbuilding slipways where very famous ships were built such as uh, Vampire and uh, Voyager and other ships like that. The flat area here where they used to stack material is now our campground. These are tents. You can actually go and camp uh, with your own tent, excuse me, or borrow uh, a tent. There are beautiful facilities including there's no, no such thing as community showers and toilets these days. There's a row of individual bathrooms, just like you've got at home. So camping has gone a little bit uh, upmarket. This is that point at Woolwich Dock where I go to sit with my grandchildren. The dock is on the other side, so we're pretty close uh, here. And Snapper is down, uh, is down here. The ferry from Wharf 5 at Circular Quay comes in here. And in the visitor centre, we will give you uh, all the maps and all the information that you need uh, to spend time on the island. You might like to pick up one of these afterwards. This is the Cockatoo Island uh, map, uh, which gives you the history and where to go uh, and all that kind of thing. And I've got them here for North Head as well. We've got about 50 different publications, I think, including all the maps that you need to do all these harbour walks. So when you're next at one of the sites, uh, pick up those maps. Old and new, you can see uh, what it was. And now on the island we have rock concerts, uh, sculpture, uh, classical music, you name it, it happens on, yes. uh, on Cockatoo Island. And that's all part of the revenue raising process. At one stage, to stop speculating, the colony's wheat crop uh, was um, kept on Dangar Island in these underground uh, receptacles. Convicts actually hollowed those out of the... Uh, out of the rock, uh, and that's where the wheat was kept uh, so that people couldn't uh, speculate. This is a very old picture of the island. You can see the old convict buildings and gradually it's being pushed, uh, pushed out here. And you can see through little dark things there which disappeared under the road to the top. And during resurfacing of the road, um, about 18 months ago, one of the uh, machines broke through the surface and underneath we found these three isolation uh, cells. So they've now all been uh, cleaned out. You can see how tiny they are, the people on the right standing there. Uh, but we've now rerouted everything so that you can see the, uh, see the isolation cells. It wasn't pretty being a convict. Convict building still there when they were doing um, sandstone work. That's the old uh, quarry and dressing station. Frederick Ward, Captain Thunderbolt, the only convict ever to escape from uh, Cockatoo Island. His wife um, said she would steal a horse and meet him on the nearest point of land, which she did. Uh, she only could find a white horse, and so it's still called White Horse Point uh, to this very day. Old picture of the island, you can see. This magnificent man was in charge of the convicts, building the convict dock where they worked in water up to their uh, uh, necks, wearing their irons. It couldn't have been a very pleasant process. HMS Galatea was the first uh, Navy ship to enter the convict built dock once it was finished. And this is what the Duke came on. Remember, he was shot at Balmoral Beach. You remember? This is the ship that he, uh, that he came on. It then became um, when there was a lot of trouble with the girls' reformatory in Newcastle. They were all transferred to Cockatoo Island. Uh, later on, under Henry Park's urging, it became a uh, place to send uh, orphan boys and street children from Sydney who lived on old uh, Navy ships in the harbour, such as the 
Vernon and the Sabron, which are probably the many of you will know. Here they are coming ashore in the morning. And they were taught the trades to be useful and evidently it was a great, uh, it was a great success. The second dock was built in 1890. I thought that the Snowy Mountain Scheme, which I worked on right through the 60s, was the only thing in Australia that was ever built ahead of schedule and within budget. But I was wrong. This dock was built on schedule and within budget by this brilliant young engineer, Louis Samuel, who tragically died of pleurisy on uh, the day that it was opened, so we lost the services. Cockatoo in 1944, 4,000 people a day going to work. Look at the activity. Look at the activity. There's not a spare place uh, where a ship or something is not being, uh, not being worked on. Must have been an incredible uh, sight, and the sound, the noise must have been amazing. So it has seen shipbuilding, they've even built aeroplanes uh, on there. Uh, fitting out of submarines, and then 1991, they had all got too much running things on an island. It wasn't terribly convenient, so it all closed uh, down. These are before and after shots. You can see how the buildings are gradually uh, being refurbished, including Bill O'Wheeler House, which was built for the, uh, for the first superintendent. So you can see today it has uh, rock concerts and uh, sculpture and motorbike competitions and all sorts of things. There's always something going on on Cockatoo Island. It's big enough to have its own website. We have a Harbour Trust website and we have a Cockatoo Island website where you can see what's happening next week and the week after and so on and so forth. That's the accommodation that's on there from camping uh, through to really, really nice restored, uh, restored houses. So like all of the sites, apart from those two we're still working on, open every day, guided or self-guided, don't forget the school accommodation program and school uh, program and, uh, and accommodation. A lot more work to be done. The volunteer, the engineering volunteers on there are restoring the old steam crane, which is going to be a real feature in the future where they, uh, they, were fantastic where they go. They're fantastic. They're fantastic. the first time I heard one of those coming. Yeah, the it's steam going to be unbelievable. They call, the boys call it the African and They move it so fast, too. Yeah. Uh, because now we're coming out of our, uh, out of our government money, we've now uh, set up a foundation called the Conservancy. And uh, if you donate $2 or more, you get a tax deductible receipt. And I'll commend that to you uh, for, the, uh, for the future. The two uh, websites, which are on that little brochure that I gave you uh, there, the Harbour Trust and the Cockatoo Island will tell you what's happening this week, next week, next year, and so on um, and so forth. And those are all the things that you can, uh, can do. I'm sorry I've gone over time, but it was lovely to be here, and I do hope that either individually or as a group, uh, you will come um, and see. And if you don't, I know where you live. <laughs> and I'll come and find you. Thank you very much.